All right, tonight we return to our discussion on Law and Gospel, part 17. Part 17. The last thing I did for the podcast was review a question and answer in regards to uh, Law and Gospel. That was interesting. And tonight we return to the book God's No and God's Yes by C.F.W. Walther. And that's the book where we obtained our 25 theses that we wrote, rewrote some of them, and we started working on which thesis? One. All right. And does anybody remember what that one says? What does it say? All right. Yeah, the Bible diff- has two major doctrines, law and gospel, and they differ from one another. There is a difference between them. So what are we trying to do in this series? Understand the proper distinction between them so that we don't do what? Mingle them, confuse them, mix them, because whenever we mix, mingle, and confuse them, what always suffers? Gospel, the law, always stays there because we're naturally inclined to a law way of thinking. Okay? And so we started working on this, and the book immediately started saying, okay, there are two, these two doctrines are fundamentally different. Here is how they're not, how did the, how did the book play, uh, word it? The point of difference between law and gospel is not, and they start telling us what's not the difference between them. I don't know why they started that way, because then they turn around and say, it's not this, we have to understand it this way. To me, it would have just been better just to say, hey, here's the correct way to understand law and gospel, but they start off by telling us, What's not the difference, all right? And how many, how many different things did we look at? We have six, right? Six. What was the first way, the point of difference between law and gospel is not, number one? All right. We cannot say that the gospel is divine and the law is human. So we could, in a sense, flip this, right? If we wanted to flip this. That if a proper understanding of law and gospel is to understand them both as being what? Divine. Both of them are from God. Law and gospel is from God. It is incorrect to say that that the uh, law or the gospel is divine and the law is human. That would be an incorrect difference. The correct way, law and gospel, they're both divine. Make sense? Okay, got that? All right. Number two, the second way that they are not, they're not different, in the, or, or the point of difference between them is not this. Number two? All right. To say that the gospel is necessary, but not the law. That is not correct. So a correct understanding would be both is necessary. Law and gospel, gospel and law are both necessary. And remember that the, the book said some things like this. Um, without the law, the gospel is not understood. And without the gospel, the law benefits us nothing. I cannot stress that enough. Without the gospel, the law benefits nothing. And Christians have this weird mentality that the law, people just need the law. All we need is we need to take the biblical law and force it upon the culture by passing laws and getting the right people into office and then we're going to fix America and we're going to reclaim it for God. Will all of those laws benefit the country? Not spiritually. Now you may, you could try to argue it would physically or, or in a, some general way, but the reality is law typically does what? It provokes sin. It causes sin to rise up in us. It's the idea that you could have something on the wall. You could have kids walking by it all day. They may not even pay any attention to it. And the minute you put a sign that says, do not touch. Oh, what is that? Okay, like they haven't seen it in a year. You put do not touch and they're like. Right? Liam would, <laughs> Liam does this. You can say, don't touch. He'll just reach over just to touch it just because you told him not to. You're like, what are you doing? Look, like, what? I just told you not. You just want to say, touch it. Go ahead, touch it. I'm begging you, touch it. And they're like, no, I'm not going to touch it. Like I've always said, the way to get your kids to read the Bible and go to church is tell them they can't. 
You can't go to church. You can't read. I'm reading it. You can't tell me what to do. All right. Because that, there's something about law that that bring that just kind of brings it up. So it is not the difference between them is what the gospel. You cannot say that the gospel is necessary, but the law is not. The correct understanding of law and gospel is that both are necessary. Everybody got that? Number three. It is wrong to think that the law is the teaching of the old and the gospel is the teaching of the new. A correct understanding is to say what? Both Old and New Testament contain both law and gospel. They contain both. All right. Number four. All right, they're saying it's, it's not correct to say that the law and gospel differ in regards to their final aim, as though the gospel is aimed at men's salvation and law simply at men's condemnation. They, they say that the correct way to understand this, a correct understanding of law and gospel, is that the final aim for salvation and law is what? Salvation. salvation. Both of them's final aim is salvation, The law does condemn, but what's the aim of that condemnation? To drive them to Christ, right? To drive them to salvation. So the aim of both is salvation, all right? What was the next one? That it's incorrect to say that they contradict each other. So what we, this is what I would like to say. A correct understanding is that law and gospel appears to contradict, because they definitely appear, but the right way of understanding, they appear to contradict, but in reality they are in harmony with one another. Does that make sense? All right, then last. All right, the, the incorrect way of understanding this is that only one of these doctrines is meant for Christians. Uh, Even for the Christian, the law still retains its significance. Indeed, when a person ceases to employ either of these two doctrines, they say he's no longer a true Christian. So a correct understanding is both law and gospel is for whom? I would like to say it this way. Law and gospel is meant for whom? Everyone. Everyone needs law. Everyone needs gospel. Now, there may be different times that one is needed in a specific situation, but everyone needs ultimately both. The Christian needs both. We, do, we need the gospel just as much as we need the law. Because what do we constantly do? We sin. Every time you look at the Bible, what do you see? You see lots of commands and imperatives, right? And that should immediately prove to what? To yourself. That you're a sinner. And so then what do you need? The gospel. You have to know where to flee. So we, we, we need both. Everybody remember all of those? All right, you got those down? Right now, the true points of difference between law and gospel are the following. Here's the true points of difference. Those are the incorrect differences. Here are the true points of difference. Number one, these two doctrines differ as regards the manner of their being revealed to man. The true difference between these two is the manner in which they are revealed to man. Everybody got that? As they're revealed to man. Does everybody think they understand that one without me explaining it correct currently? Do you think you know? Okay, that, that, well, I mean, we don't write anything down, but I'm just curious to see what people would say here. Okay, all right. The law, the man that was given was by, by God. Okay. Uh, whereas the gospel is through Moses. I mean, that's one version of the beginning of the law for Adam, through the prophets. Okay. Right? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll see. We'll see how where everybody goes with that. Okay. We're not going to talk about it right now. I just want. I'm just. I'm just going to give you the list. I'm, 
All right, right now I'm just trying to get to see. I was thinking of like, okay, they're get, if I think everyone's going to go this direction, when we circle back to it, then I'll probably go in the opposite direction just because, you know, that's what I typically do. All right, all right, so here we go. So let's make sure we understand this. The true point of difference is in regards to the manner of their being revealed to man. There is a difference somehow of them being revealed to man. Let's see what they, what they say that is. Number two, as regards their contents. There's a difference, a true difference between them and their contents. I, we definitely understand that, right? What's the content of the law? Do this. What's the content of gospel? Christ have, has done this for you. It's done, all right? Do and done is, is a good way of understanding it, all right? Next, as regards the promises held out by either doctrine. There's a difference in the promises of the law. There's a difference in the promises of the gospel. Number four. In, well, yeah, the, yeah you, well, there's a lot of things we could do yeah, with that. Okay, we'll, we'll see how, what direction they go and we'll add our own. All right, in regards to their threats. Now, that means that they say both have some kind of a threat or threatenings, which is kind of an interesting concept. We'll see how they play that out. We definitely know the threats of the law, right? So, like, what's the... Maybe? Yeah. Possibly. Well, it can't be if I don't, because then that would make the gospel something I do, so that would create a problem. So, all right, we'll have to see how they work this. All right? Uh, neck, number five, as regards the function and the effect of either doctrine. There's a difference in the function and effect. Function and effect. Everybody got that? Next, as regards, uh, as regards the persons to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. There's a, uh, as regards the persons to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. There's a difference in the persons to whom either one or the other doctrine must be preached. Now, I believe both need law and gospel. I think the issue here is there are times someone needs what? Law, and there's times someone needs gospel. The rich young ruler, when he comes to Jesus, what does Jesus give him? Law or gospel? Law. He does not even offer the gospel, which is insane. You're like, wait, Jesus, he's walking away. What are you doing? Okay, what are you doing? And that story leads to lots of confusion, does it not? And then there's other times you're like, hey, Jesus, you, we're, no law for this person? And it's just gospel. And it doesn't appear to be law. So how, how, does, that, how does that work? He didn't seem to offer the Pharisees much gospel. Was condemnation, condemnation. You hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. And you're like, whoa, what, what's going on? So there's a difference sometimes into the persons to whom each should be preached. Now, both ultimately need it, but I think I understand what they're trying to say there. As regards the person to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. All right, so this is the way they have it. The words that they want you to remember are... Uh, Manner of their being revealed, contents, promises, threatenings, function, effect, persons. Those are the words they have in italics. Like, those are the words they want you to remember. All right, everybody went ready? Okay, we're going to go to the, that first one which is the two doctrines differ in regards to the manner of their being revealed to man. All right, we're just going to kind of go through the book and see how they explain it, and we'll see. I may have you see if you can find scripture to support or disprove an idea, so be ready with the Bible to look things up if we need to. Here we go. You ready? In the first place, 
law and gospel differ as regards the manner of their being revealed to man. Man was created with the law written in his heart. Find me a scripture that supports the idea that the law was written on our hearts. I don't know. See who can find it first. You'll get $30. I don't know. Is it Romans? Who can find it first? And we have looked it up recently. Who can find it first? All right. Someone said Romans 2. We'll look it up in... All right, we say Romans 2.15. Let's take a look at it. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. All right, Romans 2.15. I'm going to go to Romans 2.12. Is everybody okay with that for context? Romans 2.12. All who sin... I'm going to read it in this translation. Someone will have the King James. Uh, St- Stephen, you got the NIV? All right, so I have multiple translations. Make sure there's no problem or any issue here. Uh, No, this, I don't even know what this one is. Uh, The Christian Standard. Christian Standard Bible. All right, here we go. (laughs) She's not a fan because she's very familiar with the Greek and Hebrew. (laughs) All right, here we go. Romans 2.12. All who sin without the law will also perish without the law. All who sin without the law also will also perish without the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. All right? Now, okay, well, there's a lot we could talk about here, but if you were going to be justified by doing the law, what would be required? We've talked about it about a hundred times now. Remember the list? Personal? Perfect? Exact? Entire? Perpetual. Perpetual, right? Okay. Everybody remember those? Oh, well, I added a few. Okay. But just stressing the idea. Well, total kind of comes in exact or perfect. All right. So, okay. So that means immediately we'd be in trouble. All right. So verse 14. So when Gentiles who do, who do not by nature have the law do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Uh, their, their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept secret according to my gospel through Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't say necessarily it was written on the heart all the way from the very beginning, but you can probably kind of imply that it does because why? Because if, if it's written on man's heart, when was it written on man's heart? And so you can just, you would have to assume that it's right from the very beginning. All right. Does that make some sense? Because before Exodus, the people, the people are doing things that are either, we've, they're viewed as either right or wrong, even before Exodus and the law is given. Agreed? Okay, so, that was Romans 2, 15. Oh, I read 12 through 15. Right. Okay, so let's go through this again. Man was created with the law written in his heart. So when it comes to how the law was revealed, we can say the law was revealed to man from the beginning in what way? But written on his heart. And what do we understand that to mean? That means people are a moral being from the very beginning with some sense of right, of some sense of right and wrong, of something being fair, something being unfair. Doesn't, kids don't need to understand law and they'll immediately start saying, that's not fair, that's not right. And they, they, they will appeal to some kind of law as something being right or right. They will even judge you according to some kind of law, right? Mom, that's not fair. Based on what? What, what definition of fair are you? Why is your definition of fair better than my definition of fair? What if my definition of fair is that, no, I'm going to do this and you can't do that. You say it's not fair. They're arguing from some kind of law. They're making a philosophical uh, argument about law. Now, typically, we just say, 
this is the worst thing a parent can say, because I said so. That's it. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> because I say so, because you say so, that law becomes the ruling law of the, of the family? But wh- why? Where does it come from? You've got to have some kind of... This is arguing for the basis of where law comes from. And what are your options for where law comes from? We go through these all the time. Majority. Minority. Individual. Or a transcendent law. That, that, that's, that's your only options, right? So when a kid says, that's not fair, they're not arguing for majority. They may not even be arguing for minority. What are they arguing? For individual. And you can say, okay, let's go with your argument. If you think that's not fair, and I think it's fair, then which one wins? Not based on who's in authority, just who, who wins? And Christians do the same thing when we get mad at the government. That's not fair. That's not right. Well, why? Because we don't like it. So then we start arguing for what kind. Now, typically what we'll do is try to find a Bible verse to say the government is wrong. Even if the Bible verse doesn't say that, we'll make it say that because now we'll bring God in to justify ourselves. But everyone's appealing to law constantly. Everyone does. People you work with who ha- doesn't go to church, haven't read a Bible in 900 years and don't believe in God will say, they will, they will condemn people's actions, jub- judge people's actions, say that's right, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. And nobody stops to go, based on what? Where does the idea come from? Oh, it's maddening to have those conversations to me. It's maddening. I'm like, okay, based off what? You're going to say that's wrong. Based off what? And then people get mad at me when I bring it up. Like, I'm crazy. I'm like, it, it, we've got to have a, a source for it. The Bible says the source is what? God, and it's a law written where? In our hearts. And so when we speak about morality, we are speaking from a morality that's been placed on our heart. Even though we may not know that it's there, that's where it came from. That's crazy to think about. It's just, it's, it's just crazy to think about, all right? Now, in the consequences of the fall, this script in the heart has been quite dulled, but it has not been utterly wiped out. Now, I don't like the way dulled, I don't like that. It has been corrupted in this sense that what we take it and then we do corrupt things with it. We have, like... We, we, we will excuse that which is evil, condemn that which is good. We, it, it, just, it gets all messed up because of sin. Now the law stays pure, right? And ultimately the law stays pure. But our perception and our use of it is corrupted. I think that's a better way of stating it, right? Our understanding of it is corrupted. The law itself comes from whom? God. So therefore it is perfect. But our understanding, and the main thing, our use of it is corrupted. Our use of it is corrupted. Now, I want you to think about that. If the use of the law is corrupted because of our sinful nature, then that corrupted use of the law, is that not just as possible after conversion as it was before conversion? Yeah. Yeah, I, I want, okay. The, the only, everyone should say yes here, okay? If, if our use of the law is corrupted before conversion, it's just as possible that we corrupt it after conversion because what cont- continues inside of us? A corrupt nature. And that corrupt nature takes that law that is written into it. So what we do, here's what, sometimes Christians are the most corrupt in the use of the law. Because it's written in our heart, the corrupt nature is there, but now we have an understanding of God. So we take law, and then we use it, utilizing God as the justifier, and then we use it in the most corrupt way imaginable, justifying that our reason in doing so is because of God. That is some messed up stuff. 
And Christians do this all the time. We don't like a rule the government does. We will boycott, rebel, do what, and say God is on our side. Even though a scripture may say, we know all authorities placed there by God and we're supposed to obey. Nope, don't have to obey it in this particular case. We'll find a reason. We'll find a way around it. We'll gossip about someone and say we're doing so for prayer purposes. We gossip, lie, slander, hurt, and use every spiritual justification under the sun. Would the Pharisees and Sadducees, would they have told you that they were doing right by trying to have Jesus killed? And they would have justified it by Scripture. Look at all the horrible things that's happened in church history. Murder, killing, you know, exiling, all the horrible things that's happened, all done in the name of Jesus. Okay? I mean, we've burned people at the stake, we've killed people, beheaded people, horrible things in the name of Jesus. All because, so I just want to make sure you understand that it's written on the heart, but because of corruption, our use of it is is so, we've always got to be careful how we're using the law. But just note that it's inside of us. That, and just make, this is very important, because the law is inside of you, written on your heart, you're going to be naturally law-based or law-minded or gospel-minded. You're going to be law-minded. Because it's where? It's inside of you. So isn't it interesting that Christianity sometimes takes on a much more law-minded perspective than a gospel-minded perspective? Is that not what we should expect to see? Because that's what's inside of us. Yes? So our danger is Everyone worries about antinomianism. The real threat is the use of the law to corrupt the gospel because we're naturally already law-based. Does that make sense? I got some looks like maybe I'm not making sense. Do I, is that, is that everybody good with that? All right, I hope so. Okay. Man was created with the law written in his heart. In consequence of the fall, the script in the heart was become quite, has become quite dulled. I, again, I would say it's the law is okay, but our understanding and use of it has become corrupted. That's the way I would, I would word it, all right? The law may be preached to the most ungodly person, and his conscience will tell him this is true. Deep down, I think we typically know, typically, that we're not all that right and we're not all that good. I think we deep down know. We know we fall, we even fall, even if you're not a Christian, sometimes we fall short even of their own morality that we hold to other people too. Right? I I think there's truth, truth to that. All right? But when the gospel is preached to him, his conscience does not tell him the same thing. The preaching of the gospel rather makes him angry. The worst slave of vice admits he ought to do what is written in the law. Why is this? Because the law is written in his heart. The situation is different when the gospel is preached. The gospel reveals and proclaims free acts of divine grace. And these are not self-evident. What God has done according to the gospel, he was not obliged to do. In other words, law, we relate to that and we're like, that makes sense. Gospel, we're like, whoa, 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 no, 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 it can't, no, it can't be, it, it can't be that easy. No, that, no, 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 no. If you say that, if you say that, people are going to run crazy and do whatever they want. We can't have that. They need some law. I think there's a reason why we're so fearful of gospel. Because the law is written in our hearts. And what do we know about ourselves? We know how sinful we are. And when we hear the gospel, this is as a believer, we have a tendency, the gospel makes us nervous because we know what we are tempted to do. What are we tempted to do? Whatever we want. So we feel like we need to hear the law to keep us from running wild. 
We need to hear that, that if, I, if I run wild, I may prove that I'm not saved. I think we overcompensate because of fear of ourselves. And then we get mad when the gospel is actually preached. There's a natural rejection to the gospel. It goes against everything. Is anything in life, does anything in life work like the gospel? It doesn't. We, what's, what's the basis of our parenting? Law. Do this and good things happen. You do bad, punishment comes. We don't parent from a gospel-based mind. We parent from a law-based mind. At work, is it gospel-based or law-based? Law. Society. Law. Everything is law. Everything. The gospel is like, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me God is absolutely holy and perfect. We all deserve death. And he's going to give us grace and mercy and save us without us doing anything? Without us requiring anything? And seeing as soon as people are like, no, 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 no. He may give it to us freely, but we have to do something. Because if we don't, we prove we didn't get it. Therefore, we're not saved. We, we immediately go, but, 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 no, 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 because we have to protect it. And what do we have to do? We got to bring in a little law to make us feel what? Whew. Makes me feel more comfortable. And I don't know if it makes us feel more comfortable because we're worried about everyone else. I think it's because we're worried about ourselves. And we overcompensate. I think there's truth to that. We know how messed up we really are. Look at how, look at your level of commitment. Look at the level of commitment by people who are like, absolutely not. If you don't do that, you prove you're not saved. You've got to do something. You've got to prove it. You've got to prove it. Look at their lives. There's usually all kinds of sin, of sin issues and all kinds of failures. But they hold on to something because they feel like if you remove that threat, of proving they're not saved, that they'll just go crazy. But all the threats in the world, does it ever change anything? we got 2,000 years of threats. Charismatics, believe you can lose your salvation. Church of Christ, believe you can lose your salvation. Catholics, believe you can lose your salvation. Are any of them more holy or godly than any other group? No. No. Lordship salvation. Are those people more godly than the so-called free grace people? They may want to appear outwardly, but inwardly they're just the same kind of sinner. We are so law, because law is where? It's right here. So the true difference is this. Law is revealed in what way? It's written in the heart. The gospel is revealed in what way? Through God's word, through the proclamation of, of the preaching and publishing of God's word. The book doesn't go into that, but I mean, it's obviously the only other option, right? Law is revealed what way? Written on the heart. Gospel is revealed through the Bible and the pro- proclamation of it. You could say in Jesus Christ. You could say the gospel is revealed in Jesus Christ. It's revealed in his word. But complete difference. So that means the law is where? internally, and the gospel is external. That, that's, a, that's the law, the law is internal. The law is written on the heart. Right? Or am I misunderstanding? Well, there's a lot of detail law, but the law itself, all of the law that's the, it's written on our hearts, it's all there. We may not be able to say it word for word, but the concept, all that's in the law is written in our hearts. It's right there. Okay? We, we deep down know. Does that make sense? We may not be able to go, we may not be able to go commandment one, commandment two, commandment three, but in a roundabout way, all of those commandments that are in the Bible are inside of us in some way, shape, or form. 
Everyone knows, the whole world knows deep down, this is the concept. So, just make sure we understand the law is where? Internal and the gospel is external. So we, we are much more law prone than we are gospel prone. Okay, that's just, that's why it shows up in our preaching. That's why it shows up in our teaching. That's why it shows up all the time. All the time. If that makes any sense. Everybody got that one? All right. That was number one. Number two. All right. The second point of difference between the law and gospel is shown by the contents of either. The law tells us what we are to do. The gospel reveals to us only what God is doing or has done. The law speaks concerning our works. The gospel concerning the great work of God. Now, you don't have to write this down word for word. Just make sure you get the idea. All right. So the law tells us what we are to do. Everybody got that? The gospel reveals what God is doing or has done. They don't put has done in the book, but I think that's important to give the present and past tense. You could argue the gospel tells us what God has done in the past, is doing in the present, and will do in the future. But the main thing is to understand the gospel deals with what God does. Done. That's a, that's a true difference between the two. The law speaks concerning our works. The gospel concerning the great works of God. In the law, we hear the tenfold summons. Thou shalt, right? Thou shalt, thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that, thou shalt do this. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this. All right, look at uh, the Ten Commandments. Go to Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20. All right, where's the first thou shalt? Verse 3, what does it say? Thou shalt not. Everybody see that? That's the first thou shalt, not, thou shalt, right? Okay, next one. What verse? Verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Right? Next one. Thou shalt not bow down before them. The next one, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The next one, which one? Okay, it just says remember the Sabbath. Okay, yeah. Next one, 13, what does it say? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not... Still, okay. All right, there you go. So you see all the thou shall nots. That's law, that's law language. Thou shall do this, thou shall not do this. If it tells you do this or don't do this, that is the language of the law. All right, that's the contents of the law. Everybody got that? The gospel, on the other hand, makes no demands. The law has nothing to say about forgiveness about grace, it issues only commands and demands. The gospel, on the other hand, only makes offers. It contains nothing but grace and truth. You need to be, you need, why do you think they want you to understand that the true difference here is the contents? They want you to know the difference is the contents so that when you read the Bible, you can immediately identify that which is law and immediately identify that which is gospel. When you read the Bible, just get in the habit going, that's law. That's law. That's law. I'll give you an, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know if anyone heard, but we did uh, three hours of sermon review last night and this morning. 
looking at a sermon uh, by Stacy Wood, which is the teaching pastor at Saddleback, used to be the Church of Rick Warren, it's a Southern Baptist Church, but they have a female teaching pastor, which is causing controversy. But I decided to deal with the news story, not because she's a teaching pastor in an SBC church, but I decided forget that she's male or forget that she's female. Let's just look at how she handles the word of God. And her sermon was the book of Joshua, chapter 4. And it was an utter, total disaster train wreck. One, maybe one of the worst sermons I've ever heard in my entire life. And I've heard thousands of bad ones. This was uh, like reached epic levels. But Joshua 4 is literally about what God did for Israel. He brings them to the, jo- the banks of the Jordan. He's the one who gives the commands to go over. He tells them what to He's the one who parts the water. He's the one who brings them across on dry. It's all about God's actions. She preached an entire sermon about, guess what? What we need to do. 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 Taking a gospel, more of a gospel-minded passage and turn it into a law-based passage. And why do you think that happens so frequently in preaching? Well, because people want something practical in the sermon. They want some points to do. They want something to do. They're not going to do it, but they at least want the three points written down in their notes. Right? They still want the three points written down. And I can't remember her three points. I don't have them written down here. They're, I got the note. Something like, something about pausing, something about putting back, pushing back the pressure. I can't remember uh, the three. But I mean, there were just like three little sayings about what we're supposed to do, which had none of it came from Joshua. None of, none of her points even came from Joshua 4. It was insane. And then she basically condemned everyone who crossed the Jordan that they were all in sin. And the reason, because they crossed the, the Jordan supposedly running. And they needed to slow down and spend some time on the beach having a devotion with Jesus so that they would have been prepared to walk into the promised land. So all of them were actually in the wrong, even though the text says that they all obeyed the commands that God had given them. So I don't know how the text says they commit, they obeyed the commands, and she comes along and says they sinned because they ran across the Jordan and they needed to slow down. It was insane. I was like, what is, but it turned into a law-based thing. But preaching, you're almost taught to preach that way. Guys, you need to do this. You need to do this. Do this. Do this. And it's fascinating to me that sometimes people will say, you, you can teach six months on the doctrine of justification. Right? Puted righteousness, infused righteousness, and someone will say, you don't preach enough gospel. And I'll be like, that, that, was, that, was, we, that, was, that was like a year-long study. And so sometimes I don't know if people can really identify what gospel preaching is and what law preaching is. I sometimes don't know what the... De- I don't, I sometimes I don't think anyone really knows what, what it is. But when it comes down to the difference between law and gospel, what's the difference? The law tells you to do, and the gospel says it's been done. But the minute... The minute so you'll be accused of not preaching the gospel, but then if you preach the gospel, then you'll be accused of, well, easy believism or something else. And it's like, you can't... <laughs> you, do you, if you really get the gospel, I'm going to tell you, it's all done in Jesus. You don't need to do anything. Well, no, 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 you can't say that. I thought you wanted gospel. No, no, give me law, give me law, give me law, okay? I, sometimes I don't know what people actually want. Because it's so, it, it, it's mind-blowing sometimes. It's confusing sometimes to hear people. But they use these theological categories. And sometimes you're like, I don't know. Because I guarantee if you were to ask her, she would say she preached the gospel that morning. And because it was an encouraging message, I bet you everyone else said it was a beautiful gospel message. There was no gospel in it. At all. That's, there's a lot to camp out right there and just talk about. There's a lot there to, to discuss, but so that we understand that we're almost out of time. I can't believe this. All right, here we go. Do we understand the contents now? 
All right, so we understand the difference in how they're revealed. How are they revealed? Laws in the heart. Gospel is preached, taught, Christ, the word. You get It's external. Everybody got that? What's the difference in the contents? It's done. Gospel is just going to tell you it's done. It's finished. It's all taken care of. Christ did it all for you. And that scares people. People say they want the gospel until they hear that, and then they'll get mad that, that, that they'll, they'll say, no, 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 you need law. And then you preach the law. Then they say, well, no, you're not preaching enough gospel. Sometimes I have no clue. I, sometimes I'm perplexed at the whole Christian world sometimes. But, all right, there you have it. All right, number three. Law and gospel differ in the third place by reason of their promises. What the law promises is just as great as what the gospel promises, namely, everlasting life and salvation. But at this point, we are confronted with a mighty difference. All promises of the law are made on the condition that we fulfill the law perfectly. Accordingly, the promises of law are the more disheartening, the greater they are. The law offers us food, but does not hand it down to us where we can reach it. It says to us, indeed, I will quench the thirst of your soul and appease your hunger, but it is not able to accomplish this because it always adds, all this you shall have if you do what I have commanded. That's beautifully put. The law gives you these great promises, amazing promises. Right? You can have everlasting life. You You can be quenched. You can be satisfied. But the only way to get it is if you do all of these things. So they become what? Very discouraging, would you not agree? Now over and against this is the language of the gospel. It promises us the grace of God and salvation without any condition whatsoever. It is the promise of free grace. It asks nothing but this. Take what I give and you have it. That is not a condition. It's a kind invitation, if I can speak correctly. The law says you can have it if you do it. The gospel says it's yours. Take, drink, eat. It's yours. Now, some will say, no, 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 no. The gospel has demands too because it says if you believe, But remember, why do we believe? Okay, everybody in this church should know this answer. The gospel seems to be saying that you can have this if you believe, but why do we believe? God gives us the faith. He gives us the faith. All right, therefore it's not a command. Christ takes care of it, yes? All right, it takes care of it all. Now, I want you to see those, those, now, this is what people do with the gospel. And they won't even realize they do this. And they'll say, hey, you need to preach the gospel more. But when you call this what I'm getting ready to say into question, they'll say you're not preaching the gospel. Then they'll, it's just, it's maddening. Sometimes I'm so confused by everything. All right, this is what they'll say. The gospel is free grace. You believe, you don't have to do anything. And then wait for it. But if you don't do this, you're not saved. (laughs) That's not freedom. That's a condition, is it not? You're only saved if you do these things. The gospel says, I don't have to do anything. Why don't I have to do anything because of the gospel? It's been done. So I can't go to Bobby and go, Bobby, if you're truly saved, then you won't do this and you won't do this and you won't do it. Then immediately what I'm saying is that Christ didn't do it. Bobby now has to do it. It, it, it's, it destroys the whole doctrine. And people will say that with a straight face. and not. A, I'll give you an example. All right. I don't know if you uh, heard the, uh, the review of the Q&A for this series. But in the Q&A, it's, oh, 
I almost fell out of my chair and had a seizure right in the middle of it. Because I just can't under... Here's this person giving this beautiful discussion about the proper distinction between law and gospel, right? And it was interesting because the man was talking. It was really funny. He started as a Lutheran, okay? He became, a, he became saved in the late 80s, maybe a year or two after me. He lived in Nebraska, was a Lutheran, right? I was saved in Texas, became a Lutheran, right? It's just real. He, he found law and gospel outside of Lutheranism. My first time of hearing of law and gospel was within Lutheranism. It was just the, the parallels between both of us was pretty interesting. Okay, but he gives this beautiful distinction between law and gospel. Beautiful distinction. It sounds so good. But then he almost gets nervous. So then he says this. Now, if someone claims to be a Christian, and they're living with their girlfriend, and they've been living with their girlfriend for 10 years, well, obviously, they're not a Christian. (laughs) Wait a minute. And I believe that was the Q&A. That could have been the first John message. I don't know. I've reviewed too many sermons. So so if I'm saying that incorrectly, those who listen to everything, someone will correct me here in a minute and say, no, that was the first John one. Okay, But in one of those... It was this bizarre thing where they're giving supposedly a correct understanding of the gospel and then immediately contradict that. You can't look at someone and go, oh, you've been living with your girlfriend for 10 years, you can't be saved. That immediately makes salvation then based off what? Something you do or don't do. So, you're, so, so here's the case. If you live with your girlfriend for 10 years, you're not saved. You're telling me there's not men in churches that have had lust for 10 years? So are they saved? Are you telling me there's women in the church who have been sub- haven't been submissive to their husband in 10 years? Are they saved? I mean, I can find... Oh, oh let's go with the big three. Is there anyone in, in this church who hasn't loved God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul for 10 years, loved their neighbor as himself, and been as holy as God is holy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be like, I wish it was only 10 years. Okay, all right. So everyone's been guilty of all of that for 10. How come that? Now you see immediately what happens. You can be saved and violate those three scriptures continually for 10 years. But if you live with your girlfriend, you're going to hell. Now what did they just do? Made mortal and venial sins. Okay, someone just said, I am right, it was the Q&A. Okay, I knew someone online would remember. I knew someone online would remember. Okay, good. So, the, I want you to see, they immediately make it what? A mortal and venial situation. Don't you see how that destroys everything? It destroys the gospel completely. Now, if someone hears me say, so you're telling me someone can live with their girlfriend for 10 years and be saved? Oh, that's antinomian. You're, you're easy believism. No, are they saved by what Christ did or are they saved by what they do? Well, they're saved by what Christ did. Then don't condemn them based off what they do. They can't hear how illogical they are when they are. Like you're, you're talking in circles. Under, either it's what Jesus did or it's what I do. You're only two choices. It's done or I don't know if it's done until I get to the end. Because who knows? Right? Who knows? Tomorrow, Bobby can say, that's it, Diane, and, goes, gets, and he lives with his girlfriend for 10 years. So Bobby can't be sure that he's saved. He's got to get to the end and make sure he never lived with a girlfriend for 10 years. Because that's the break. I want, does nine years, are you good to go at nine? How about eight? Why does it take ten years before you're no longer saved? Or you prove you were never saved? Like, uh, one month? One month, you're good. Like, do, do you see how weird that, like, how do you, how do you understand that? <laughs> like, it makes no sense. And this was at a conference where they were trying to give us the right understanding of law and gospel. But we can't stop ourselves. We can't stop our, because the closer we get to that, like, oh no, oh no, if, if everyone's going to run crazy, everyone's already running crazy. <laughs> okay? 
All the threats and all of the, it doesn't change anything. I, I, I learned that just as a preacher. You're supposed to love the Word of God. You're supposed to read it. You're supposed to meditate it. It's supposed to be most important to you. And if you don't do that, you're probably not saved. Did that make anyone read their Bible one, one second more? No, it didn't do anything. So it was a waste of time. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah, it just oh, it drives me crazy. All right? So let's go through these, this one one more time. All right? We'll just, we won't go to number four. We'll just repeat number three. All right? Everybody ready? The law and gospel differ in the third place by reason of their promises. What the law promises is just as great as what the gospel promises, namely everlasting life and salvation. But at this point, we are confronted with a mighty difference. All promises of the law are made on the condition that we fulfill the law, this is very important, perfectly. Accordingly, the promise of the law are the most disheartening. The greater they, because of, uh, the greater they are, the more disheartening they become. The law offers us food, but does not hand it down to us where we can reach it. It says to us, indeed, I will quench the thirst of your soul and appease your hunger, but is not able to accomplish this because it always adds this. All of this you shall have if you do what I command. Over and against this note, the language of the gospel, it promises us the grace of God and salvation without any condition. That's why we are saved not by works. Now they'll say, but, 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 we're created to do good works. You can say all day I'm created to do good works and I won't argue with you. You can't turn around and say, if I, how many good works do I have to have to prove that I'm saved by grace apart from works? The minute you say I have to have the works to prove that I'm saved means that works are necessary for my salvation. You can't, you're just talking in nonsensical circles. It is a promise of free grace. People don't like free grace. When we say free grace, what will they accuse it of being? Easy believism, antinomianism. They'll accuse it of every name they can find. They'll, find, they'll look up a theological dictionary and find things to accuse it of. If the grace isn't free, it's not grace. Thank you. I wanted someone to say that. If it's not free grace... It's not grace. It's works. And you can't say it's free grace. And then come along and go, Bobby, how long have you been saved? Well, you're doing, you're doing this. And you're, you can't be saved. Well, that immediately just says what's required for Bobby to be saved. The doing or not doing of certain actions. That's not free. That's law. It, the gospel asks for nothing. It says, take what, I, take what I give and you have it. That's not a condition, but a kind invitation. We'll stop there. Any questions? What are the three ways in which they're different? Number one. How it's revealed, number two, contents, number three, promises. All right, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can ask afterwards. For now, we'll pray. Lord God, we come before you this evening. Help us understand the proper distinction between law and gospel so that we do not abuse and confuse and misinterpret and mispreach the gospel you have given us. But help us understand it clearly so that we can be gospel-minded instead of law-minded. Forgive us when we have failed in this area. We ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...